I'd like to read Psalm 150 to prepare our hearts for our particular theme this morning. We read these verses, culmination of 149 other psalms. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound and praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. God's word to us. I'm wondering if any of you have kids in your house, or maybe grandkids that come to visit that like to take things apart. You have any kids like that in your life? You give them a screwdriver, and before you know it, they're taking apart the family computer, the toaster, whatever it is. I mean, the good news is that it's actually a real sign of intelligence. Um, the bad news is you may never have toast again. And so there we go. Um, I guess parenting experts would probably tell us to encourage that gift, you know, give them the tools, let them go see what happens. There's actually a grown-up term for that. It's called reverse engineering. Have you heard of that field before? Um, Reverse engineering is especially in technology, and what they'll do is uh, sometimes it's even one company studying what another company is doing. They'll take some product, and they'll really just deconstruct it. They'll, They'll walk it back. They'll take it all apart, lay everything out just to see what makes it tick, and then with the specific um, interest in just then building it back up or actually maybe taking from it some of the elements that are the most helpful so that they can employ them for their own ends and their own inventions. So it's pretty fascinating to do this. It's pretty fascinating to see this in the world of tech, but it's actually even more powerful, I think, even more strategic to do this with various practices in our lives to look at our lives, to look at the way we do things, what we say, outcomes, and then kind of walk them back and say, okay, what are the factors that actually led up to that? What built towards that? Now, I'm not gonna say this doesn't take some courage and some some bravery. In fact, it takes some some, some hard work, but it actually is really highly worth it. And I'm gonna suggest that we'll find this especially worthwhile, even in our practices of discipleship maybe even in our practice of prayer. So this morning we're continuing in our series on prayer that we're calling Praying with Paul. And what we've been doing is looking at different places in the New Testament where Paul prays, where he writes in his letters the things that he's praying about, his his thoughts on prayer, again, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Then we've been asking ourselves, you know, what can we put into practice? What do we learn that we want to pray about? how these things would shape our prayers. In our first week, which was two weeks ago, was our primer, our gateway message. We we heard and looked at a couple of verses that spoke about Paul's values on prayers, that they would be be regular, that there'd be a, a true quantity to them. Pray without ceasing, he says. But then Paul is not just asking us to fill the air with empty words. He's saying pray, but pray with meaningful prayers. There's a quality to them. Last week, we talked about the place of thanksgiving in our prayer lives and how that's this opportunity to really flip the script. And a lot of times we're going through things in life that might be difficult or dark or hard, but it's amazing how when we come to those things with thanksgiving, it really shapes and changes our prayers and our entire outlook, our walk with Jesus. This week, we want to look at the place of praise, adoration. Sometimes we call it our worship. And we want to look at the place that these have in Paul's life. Then specifically what we want to do is look at places where we find Paul lifting up words of praise, hymns to God. He's calling other people to do the same. And we want to reverse engineer these. We want to look at them and like take them back and ask ourselves these questions. What do we learn about the roots, the source of where this praise was coming from? And then with the application in mind, okay, now we want to build things back up again and say what elements from what we saw in Paul's prayer life can we build into our own prayer life and our communion with God? So question being, in the places that we see Paul lift up prayer and praise, what do we see as we reverse engineer these? I think one of the first things that we're going to see is that praise and adoration flow 
naturally from his life. Praise and adoration flow ever so naturally. We look at two scriptures at the outset of two of his very significant letters. Cameron read one of them for us by way of our opening prayer, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 says this. Blessed be, or we might say praise be, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comforts. As Paul is coming at the beginning of these letters to everybody who's listening to God, the readers of his letter, he's declaring praise and he's inviting people to join him in praise. And then as we continue to study all of Paul's writings, it's amazing because almost every single letter, within about three verses, You're going to run into praise. You're going to run into thanksgiving so that we see these things are really natural. They're the things that he wants to get to. They're not just tack-ons. Another place that we see this is in Romans 11, verse 33. After 10 chapters of reminding people that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. I mean, Paul can't help but just break out into praise and worship. Oh, the depth, the riches, the wisdom, the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. It's natural. It's just flowing out of him. There's some metaphors in the Bible that get used a number of different times. One is of trees and the fruit that they produce. Another one is of springs or or wells or water and the kind of quality of water that comes forth. And these metaphors then highlight these sources and the quality of, of that which they produce. It's kind of an agricultural reverse engineering if you want to think of it that way i think as we look at the life of paul we see a real healthy tree a real healthy spring and well of water because in his words and in his prayers it just naturally flow with praise that's because his heart is captivated by god that's what's there for real and so these things come out for real. His praise is who he sees God to be. His adoration is because he's seen God be who he is. That's Ephesians chapter 1, right? God, he's a God of blessing and he's amazing and Paul can't help but talk about it. He's seen God encourage and bring comfort and ministry a million thousand times over and he can't help but talk about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3. He doesn't have to add these to his prayer list. He's not sitting there with writer's block going, oh man, I've just got nothing to say about God. It's here, and it's living, and he says it. If you bump into him, worship is gonna spill out. We all have people in our lives, maybe it's at work or we get to a family gathering, and you just know when I bump into this person, this is what they're gonna start talking about, right? Right? All of us know right now who's going to start talking about the Chiefs tomorrow morning, right? The first thing. We hope, we hope they're going to have good things to say, right? But when you bump into Paul, adoration, worship spells out, right? Naturally. What if we reverse engineer our own prayers? We, we look at our, our prayer journals, what we write. Do praise and adoration, do they flow naturally? Are they present at all? If, if they're not, then we want to ask some good questions. Some good, healthy, walking with Jesus questions. Who is God to us? Who do we see him to be? Another question. Who do we see ourselves to be before a holy God? These are questions that can, can help us grow as so we ask these, these, uh, these reverse engineering questions of our prayer life. I was made aware this week of a book that came out a number of years ago that was called Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. Pretty compelling work. And then I also read a helpful summary, and I want to quote this to you somewhat at length because I think it's helpful in this discussion here conclusion of this book was that many young American adults have a faith that's characterized, or you might say described as moralistic, therapeutic deism. Now, according to this view of God, if we live good lives, if we're kind to others, then God will provide therapeutic benefits like self-esteem, happiness, 
Other than that, God's not much involved in this world. This view of God has a profound effect on prayer. Smith found that American teens personally prayed frequently. 40% prayed daily or more. Only 15% said that they never prayed. However, their motivation for prayer largely focused on meeting their own needs. Some of the teens interviewed said, if I ever have a problem, I go to pray. It helps me deal with my problems. It calms me down for the most part. Praying just makes me feel more secure, like there's something there helping me out. I would say prayer is an essential part of my success. Now, as a small aside here, nothing wrong with bringing to God our, our, our cares and our, our fears and our anxieties. The scripture tells us, cast all your cares on him because he cares for us. But here's an important uh, conclusion here by way of warning. The author also found that many young Americans' prayers lacked any sense of repentance or adoration. Smith writes, this is not a religion of repentance from sin. Again, Smith concludes that this distant God is not demanding because his job is to solve problems and make people feel good. There's nothing here to evoke wonder and admiration. There's nothing here to evoke wonder and imagination and, and, and adm admiration, forgive me. Compelling article. The only thing I would add to this is, is this just teens? That was the only thing when I was reading this was I'm not ready to point fingers at American teenagers and adolescents because what was just written here, I think truth in advertising sounds a lot like my prayer life. And maybe I think if we're honest, a lot of us struggle in our prayer lives. Is there anything in our prayers that evokes wonder and admiration or our prayers just about us? And so these bring us to these really critical questions in our prayer life. What do our prayers reveal about what's in here for us? What do we see the goal of prayer to be? Is it all about us? I think it also asks What's the relational dynamic of our prayers? Do we see prayer as more than just an opportunity to ask God to do things? Or when we come before him, is there a sense where we ask, what do I want God to experience from me in this moment? In my time of prayer, do I want him to receive from me who he has created, praise, and adoration, these things flow naturally in the heart and the life of Paul. That much is clear. I think another thing that we see as we look at Paul's prayers, his, his songs, his writings, is that the Holy Spirit is Paul's guiding influence. The Holy Spirit is Paul's guiding influence. I want to read again this verse we've called to our attention a number of times. Ephesians six eighteen. We are called to be praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Another verse, Jude one twenty, refers to our prayers in that way, being praying in the Spirit. Now, oftentimes we read these verses with questions of the charismatic in mind. We wonder, is this referring to prayer languages? Is this about speaking in tongues? Now, there's good discussion, further Bible study to have, on those topics. In short, I do want to say that even while those demonstrations are not necessarily a part of our normal corporate culture here at the Springs, or, or probably not across the, the breadth of our denomination, the EFCA, but I also want to say that we're not a denomination nor a church that says those things have ceased. We're not cessationists, is, is the way that they call it in theological language and jargon to say those things are done. They don't exist anymore. But if we can at least just for a moment set those things aside, what I want us to see is that I believe, I, and I agree with other interpreters of this passage, that at its most straightforward level, to pray in the Spirit is to simply be guided by, empowered by, led by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes more than we think, this is very simple in the way that it is expressed. And yet at the same time, 
It's more powerful and rich than we can imagine. I want to read now some verses from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Sometimes when we come to a passage of Scripture, we wonder what exactly does that mean. The best commentary is another part of Scripture. I think Ephesians chapter 5 is a great commentary on what praying in the Spirit is all about. We read this, Don't get drunk with wine, that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And now, what does this look like? Verse 19, Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and here, paraphrase this idea of being under the influence. So whether it's our own experience or whether we've seen it displayed in other people, we all know what it means for someone to be under the influence, right? Now, Paul says here, don't don't be under the controlling influence of alcohol or, or drugs or other substances. Instead, absolutely and in every way possible, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that look like? In this context, it looks like something very normal. Something that we do every week, although something that we don't want to just take for granted and go through the motions. What does he talk about? To live and be filled with the Spirit is to have a heart of, of music to sing, to worship, to lift up adoration. Again, pretty simple, straightforward result that praise will come forth from our hearts and that when people bump into us, that's what they're gonna hear. How awesome God is and the ways that he's worked in our life and the ways that he wants to work in their lives. Now, Paul doesn't specifically mention prayer here in this context, but certainly this passage speaks to this baseline of what it means to pray in the Spirit. Prayers under the influence of the Spirit are going to be filled with worship, adoration, praise, and thanksgiving. Once again, just to mention that thoughts of speaking in tongues or prayer languages, if you have questions on those, I don't want to seem like we're just throwing those aside. I'd love, if you have questions, again, please let me know. Love to walk with you, and those are further discussions. But again, this baseline. When we see Paul open his mouth to pray, to teach, to write, to do anything, he's going to bring praise. He's going to worship. He's going to glorify God because the Holy Spirit is in him. The Spirit's dancing in his heart. He's stirring up the waters. He's splashing about, and he's sloshing out of the cup of Paul's heart, praise and adoration. Again, we come back to this and we just ask, how about us? When we consider our own words, especially our prayers, maybe even when other people hear us pray, is it as clear as it is with Paul, whose influence we're under? We under the Holy Spirit's influence? We under the influence of another factor. You know that you can pray under the influence of other factors than the Holy Spirit? We can sometimes pray under the influence of worry or fear. Worry and fear can drive the substance of our prayer in directions that actually aren't the way that the Holy Spirit would lead us to pray. We can pray under the influence of the world or the flesh. Before we know it, we can be praying for success and ease and recognition, only to realize those aren't the values that the Holy Spirit would lead us to pray under. Whose influence are we praying under the guidance? There's a popular phenomenon right now, certainly I don't remember it when I was growing up, but it's the category in our world of influencers. You're aware of influencers? Influences are people that through social media and through other online platforms bring influence towards what? Anything that you can imagine. What tech you should use, what clothes you should wear, what food you should eat. I mean, they're in every, every category. In fact, it's such a new popular category that you ask kids these days, what's something that you want to be when you grow up? You'll find kids... I want to be an influencer. Towards what? 
they may have no idea at this point, but they just want to be an influencer, right? The description is fitting. People are saying, live this way. Think this way. So we ask ourselves, who are we under the influence of? There's a million different influences in this world, and we're, we're led and we're captured by any number of them, but the Scriptures call us to regularly invite the Holy Spirit to influence us in every way, and especially when we pray. So as we're walking through this series and we're asking about next steps that we can take with, with Jesus, I think one of the fundamental places to start is hand in hand with the Holy Spirit, which is going to involve a slowing down and a listening process to our prayers, wherein as we begin to pray, we'll say, Holy Spirit, I can't do this on my own. I fundamentally need your strength because this is a supernatural exercise. I'm, I'm like out of my depth here. But now, Holy Spirit, I'm going to pray for my kids and my family and my spouse and my church and my country and this world. So good counselor, teach me to pray. What should I pray? Shape my words. And one thing that I can guarantee, if and when you do that, adoration, praise is going to be front and center, particularly of the person and the work of Jesus. We remember in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit's commission, his favorite thing to do is to bring attention to Jesus. And so when we invite him to be our influence. We're going to discover that our prayers center on Jesus and the cross and his resurrection and the relationship we have with the Heavenly Father through him. Paul prayed in the influence of the Holy Spirit. Pray that we can follow in the same regard. You know, when you reverse engineer things, it's not just merely so you can take it apart and then leave it on the table that you've dissected it on. This is kind of why we don't normally give our work laptops to our kids and our grandkids, right? Because we're not sure they're going to be able to put them back together again as much as we love them. I hope over the last few minutes that we've been able to ask some good questions about prayer, but more so than just for, oh, I wonder, you know, kind of clinically speaking what Paul's prayer life and, and what he was all about, what made him tick. No, we want to do that so that we can see what's there and then put the pieces back together, build them forward so that we can grow in prayer. One of the things that I'm aware of in a series like this is that a lot of us are coming into this saying, I'm not good at prayer. I've tried this before. I'm bad at prayer and everybody else is good at prayer. To which I would say, that's just a lie of the enemy. That's not true. Very few people are just good at prayer from the outset. Prayer like anything else takes practice it takes commitment it also includes this aspect of bringing praise and adoration into it ultimately prayer praise worship is the work of God in our lives and so we ask for his help we ask him to teach us to pray and we practice a little bit at a time we keep stretching our prayer muscles we step into it, and he's with us at every step. I want to add one aspect to participation with the Holy Spirit. This is key. As we follow Jesus, as we take next steps with him, one of the ways that we can participate in the Holy Spirit's work in our life is to engage in very simple disciplines, taking up sometimes tools that can give him a place and a space to work. Sometimes we, we have a desire, the Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Sometimes it's really helpful to make sure that there's some kind of uh, physical tool, some really practical tool that we can put into place in our lives where we can present it to God, the Holy Spirit, and say, Lord, would you use this as, as part of what you're doing in my life? Example, you want to, let's say, grow in a relationship or, or in your, your marriage. So you need to build into that uh, a date night, for example. Or maybe you, you read a book together 
with your spouse. You're taking up a real practical tool so the Holy Spirit can use that. Or maybe you want to grow in knowledge in a certain area of scriptures or theology. Maybe you decide to attend one of the classes on Sunday morning at the, at the Springs because you're taking on a, a practical tool so that then the Holy Spirit can flood that with his power and his work. Well, in prayer, there's some tools that we can apply to help us practice stretch our prayer muscles. So I just, in the time we have left, I'm going to share a few of these with you. They've been helpful to me. Some of them, I doubt, will be new to you. But maybe some of them will be. We'll begin with the greatest prayer tool ever. I mean, we'd be remiss if we don't mention the Lord's Prayer, right? The greatest prayer tool that we've ever been given. I love how we are given this prayer tool. Here's the disciples. Jesus, teach us to pray. Can it just get more basic and fundamental than that? I mean, we're all right there in the midst of that, right? Here's the apostles. Probably by the end of their ministries, they'd be described as mighty in prayer. Where did they start out? Jesus, we got no clue like how to do this. So teach us how to pray. And what does Jesus say? Guys, figure it out. You drive me crazy. You ask for help all the time. No, he says, I've been waiting for you to ask. Let me present to you a way that you can pray. Certainly, you can pray the Lord's Prayer straight out. That's absolutely um, fitting. But then also, it can be a great model of prayer that we walk through. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 says, Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here we find ourselves orientating ourselves to the greatness of God, to the priority of his kingdom. It really sets things out straight in their right place. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. This is where we know that God doesn't look at our needs and say prayer should never be about those. He knows there are things in our hearts, practical things that do make us anxious, Bring those things to him and look to him for his provisions. Verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is our orientation towards God that we need his forgiveness and his grace and then it sets us up to remember that we're not just receiving his grace, we're extending that to other people. Then lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. This is orientating ourselves towards the evil in this world, saying, God, rescue us from it, protect us from it. We don't want to have any part with it. It's a great model. I'll just share with you again, it's helped to me as I walk with Jesus. There are so many times where I'll kneel down to pray or I'll pull out my prayer journal, and I really, I feel like the apostles, the disciples at the beginning of their prayer lives. Just so many plates spinning, Lord, I don't even know where to begin. Can you help me? And the Lord's Prayer is really amazing ministry just to walk through that. And the Lord helps me. And I'm so thankful. Look at two other acronyms that have been shared with me. I I didn't create these by any stretch. Many people have found the blessing of ACTS. A-C-T-S. Adoration. God, you're amazing. Confession. Forgive, thanksgiving, recognizing what God has already done. And then supplication, bringing before God the things that are in our heart. A friend of mine even recently added to that submission. And I like that. Because then at the end of our prayers and as the Spirit has guided us and as we're thinking, okay, now we're marching forward from this time. God, I'm, I'm, I'm your child. I'm your servant. You're not my servant. Pray. There's another acronym, P-R-A-Y. Praise, repent, ask, and yield. And all these are just tools, simple tools that can give us guidance. They're comprehensive so that prayer doesn't just become about our own needs and, and the things that we are looking for. And what I love about all of these models are that praise and adoration come first. Even the Lord's Prayer, recognition, hallowed be your name at the outset, saying, Lord, this is who you are. May you be revered in my life. May you be revered even as we pray. 
If you're sensing in yourself a, a desire to grow, a hunger, even in the midst of the series, to take next steps in your prayer life, praise and adoration is a great place to begin, to build off of that theme, to build that into your prayer life. I guarantee you it'll bring something fresh and new and alive. Just if you were wanting to have reference of these acronyms and Lord's Prayer, if you're curious about the article that I read earlier, always in your worship folder, you'll see a little QR code and we put questions about the message and we'll include notes there and things that you might want so you can follow that QR code and all those, all those things are there for you if, you if you wanted those for reference later. We'll just conclude with this. It's clear that as we look at Paul's words, and his writings, his prayers. He's a man filled with the Holy Spirit who has praise and adoration for God just gushing from him. You bump into him, these are the things that are gonna slosh out. And so our opportunity today, again, is not merely to observe and to reverse engineer just kind of scientifically. It's much more than that. It's our opportunity to learn and grow and be shaped so we can see our own prayer lives grow in their strength and in their quality. Prayer and adoration become pivotal starting points in this journey. We've got practical tools like the Lord's Prayer, these other prayer acronyms like Acts and Pray. These are great tools for us. But in all this, we're remembering that prayer is an incredible gift. It is an incredible gift that God has given to us and even looking at that, we realize God wants to hear from us as our loving Heavenly Father. And perhaps then, from our standpoint in prayer, the greatest treasure of prayer is to bless God through it. And as we practice praise and adoration, to take up this opportunity to bless Him. So as we step away from our prayer times, His heart is blessed. That's the greatest blessing that we have in this grift of prayer.